Okay, in this video, I want to show you another use for the quotient topology. So the examples we've seen so far have been mostly about gluing spaces up out of simpler spaces or crushing pieces of spaces down to a point like you get the pinch torus out of a torus. But the kind of quotient we're going to look at in this video is involves symmetry in a crucial way and the notion of a group action. So we'll be quotienting spaces by group actions. So let me remind you what a group action is. Uh, a group action is a homomorphism from a group that's doing the acting to the set of permutations of some set. In our case, x is going to be a topological space. Uh, let, let's call this something, let's call it rho. Okay, so we have some map rho from g to the set of permutations. In other words, for each group element, we get a permutation. And because it's a homomorphism, if we apply two different group elements, we just get the composition of the permutations. And if we apply the identity element, we do the identity permutation. It doesn't change anything. So for example, the symmetry group of a triangle I think people call it various things, but I'll call it D3, the dihedral group of a triangle. That's where the three comes from of a triangle acts on the set of vertices of the triangle. So this is the equ equilateral triangle, I should say. Right, so here's our equilateral triangle, vertices 1, 2, 3. If I do some symmetry, like say a reflection, that permutes two and three. So um, row of the reflection like this is uh, the permutation two, three. And if I did a rotation instead, row of the rotation by rotation um, would be the permutation one, two, three. That's 120 degree rotation. That would be one, two, three. Okay, this is just an example of a group action in a very sim simple case. Um, so we're going to be interested in group actions on topological spaces. So um, definition: a uh, continuous group action. is a homomorphism. So it's a group action. On a topological space, X. And, crucially, each map rho g each permutation is a homeomorphism of x so in particular each of these permutations that you're doing to your topological space is continuous right so permutation is just a map bijective map from x to itself and we're requiring it to be continuous and its inverse to be continuous as well now, of course, the fact the inverse is continuous is actually automatic from this definition because group elements have inverses. So the inverse of rho g is rho of g inverse, which is then automatically continuous. But I'll, I'll say it like this anyway, just to emphasize the fact that each group element acts as a homeomorphism of x. So for example, here's a very simple example, but it's a really important example for this course, you could take x to be the real line. And you could take g to be the integers. 
and the action would be maybe translation by an integer amount along the real axis. So for example, row of zero is the identity map, row of one is the map that sends x to x plus one. Slightly confusing notation, row of one is a map from the real line to the real line. It takes x and it adds one to it. Row of n, more generally, the thing that sends x to x plus n. That's an example. Translation by an integer amount is a continuous map. It's a homeomorphism of the real line. Its inverse is subtracting off that integer. So this is a continuous group action. Related example, one dimension up. Um, you could take, uh, so this was example one. This is going to be example two. You take the plane. R2, you take the group to be pairs of integers and you act using integer translations in both directions. So now let me divide the plane up into little squares, one by one squares, and you know I'll do in, in red maybe there's one set of translations that do this. So this is the action of um, the element one zero in Z two. So this acts by translating by one in the X direction. And then there's another translation in the Y direction and any combination of them lives in the group. So what does this have to do with quotient spaces? Well, whenever I have a group action, I actually get an equivalence relation. Let me put it in a box here. So given a group action, of the group G on space X, um, we get an equivalence relation. That says two points are related or equivalent. If and only if there exists some group element G such that G of X equals Y. So in this first example, uh, let me do it in green. All these points that are exactly one apart are equivalent. So that green set of points is one equivalence class. Here's an orange set of points that's also one equivalence class because they're all one apart. Here's a pink equivalence class. You get the idea. And you can see what the quotient's going to be in this case, right? Because every point is um, equivalent to one of the points between these two green points, say, by just translating along. And the two green points are equivalent to each other. So the quotient space in this first case will be the circle. Right? Because you walk along the interval until you get one along, and then you come back to where you started. So um, we write the quotient space, in this case, this very particular kind of equiv equivalence relation as x mod g. So in this first example, r mod z is another way of writing the circle. In the second example, what do we get? Any of these squares can be translated back to our favorite square, so this one. 
and once we've done that we still have to identify the opposite edges because they're separated by you know, group elements so in this case r2 mod z2 equals the two torus not surprising because r2 is r times r z2 is z times z so we should get r mod z times r mod z which is s1 times s1 which is exactly what the two torus is So this construction of quotienting by group action is going to be incredibly important when we come to study covering spaces later in the course. Uh, so let me give you one more example before I prove an important property of, of the covering of these uh, quotients. Um, so example three, uh, let X be the circle um, thought of as sitting inside the complex plane, let G be the group of nth roots of unity for some n. This is a cyclic group of size n. And we're going to let this act on the circle by just rotating using this root of unity. So remember the roots of unity are the e to the i 2 pi k over n's where k is 0 up to minus one and these guys are the points e to the i theta so uh, the action is just going to be rho of e to the i 2 pi k over n acting on e to the i theta is going to be e to the i theta rotated by this amount, so theta plus 2 pi k over n. It's continuous and it's a homomorphism you can check. Um, so here's the circle. Let's say it's the third root of unity, it doesn't really matter. So these three points form an equivalence class, these three points form an equivalence class because they're just rotated by 2 pi over 3 radians. There's another equivalence class. And you can see what's the quotient going to be? The quotient's going to be the circle again because I start with this black point here, I walk around until I get to the next black point which is related to the first one. So that's a circle. But let's just go through carefully and check that using what we know about the quotient topology. So in this case we can be very explicit, there's a map from the circle to the circle that takes some complex number e to the i theta or z, so e to the i n theta, z to the n, that's a continuous map, oh, this is just a polynomial, constructed to the circle, and I claim it descends to this quotient. It descends to s1 over g. Remember what that means is if I do uh, f evaluated at z times one of these roots of unity I should get the same as just f of z. And that's true because if I raise this to a power n I just get z to the n times e to the i 2 pi k cancels with this 1 over n in the exponent and that's exactly right because e to the i 2 pi is 1 so that gives me z to the n okay so function from s1 to s1 that descends to the quotient space means that we get a function on a quotient which is continuous I'm going to be calling it f bar And this first map was n to 1, right? There are n points sent to every point in the circle. For example, if we look at the point 1 in the circle in the target, the pre-image of that is the nth root of unity, and there are n of them. Okay, but now we're identifying n of those points using this equivalence relation, so this f bar is actually bijective.
So we can prove that this is actually a homeomorphism from the quotient to the circle. As long as we know that the circle is Hausdorff, which we know because it's a subset of a Hausdorff space, and as long as we know that the circle modulo the group is compact, which we know because quotients of compact spaces are compact. That's not too hard to prove. So F bar is a homeomorphism that allows us to identify what the quotient space is. So this is the kind of slightly more rigorous way of identifying what a quotient is that you almost never do in practice because you can usually see what the quotient is supposed to be. So the last thing I want to say for now about quotients by group actions is to prove a nice property, a really nice property of quotient maps by group actions. Um, so let x be a space and g be a group which acts continuously. on x then the quotient map from x to x mod g is not only a continuous map which we already know it's what's called an open map so a continuous map is one where the pre-image of any open set is open an open map is one where the image of any open set is open So that's a really nice property, and it's not true in general for quotient maps. But it is true for this particularly nice kind of quotient where you have a group acting on the space X. So how do we prove this? Well, we start with an open set in X and we want to look at its image. So let U be an open set in X. Um, its image Q of U under the quotient map is continuous, uh, sorry, is open um, only if and only if its pre image Q inverse of Q of U is open in X. Right, this is the definition of the quotient topology that a set in the quotient is open if and only if its pre image under the quotient map is open. Now you might look at this and think, hooray, we're done, Q inverse Q is the identity, but Q is not an invertible map, so we can't just cancel Q inverse with Q. Um, we have to figure out what this set is. So let, let's just do an example for a second. Let's suppose X is the real line. We know the quotient is, is the circle. Um, we're identifying all these points and integers distance away from one another with a single point like this one. So let's take uh, a, an open interval like this red one here in X. So that's our U. Let's look at its image. That's some open interval in the circle. What's its pre-image under the quotient map? Well, it certainly contains U, but it also contains all the other possible pre-images living between all the other possible pairs of black points. So this um, etc. There's infinitely many components. This is Q inverse of Q of U. This is Q of U. Remember this. This is the map Q here. Right, so U is just one of these intervals. Q inverse of Q of U is infinitely many intervals. So you see this is not just U. But what is it? Well, Q inverse Q of U consists of all points in X um, which are equivalent to a point in U under the group action. 
can say all points x in x such that there exists a g with gx in u. And you can see that here, right? These red guys are all translates of u by some integer amount. In other words, q inverse q u equals the union over the group elements of g applied to u. Right, we take this interval, we apply the translation by 1, 2, 3, minus 1, etc. And this is a union of open sets. These are open sets because each element in the group, I should really write row of g here, but who cares? Each element of the group is acting as a homeomorphism. Right, so u itself is an open set, g is acting as a homeomorphism, so g of u is an open set. This is a union of open sets, so this is open. Right, so that shows you that q of u is open because its pre-image into the quotient map is open. You see, we really use the group action here. In general, there's nothing like this that allows us to make this argument for a quotient space that isn't a group quotient. So we'll come back to this stuff, and this lemma will be really useful when we're studying covering spaces and covering theorems.